Tommy, welcome to Halloween Daily. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you, Matt. It's good to be here. Well, as, as you can see, I'm, I'm just a little excited to be uh, here on the occasion of the 40th anniversary this month of the release of Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. And um, so looking forward to talking all things Silver Shamrock with you today. I will start by showing you a logo. This is a first, an absolute premiere. It'll be on the back of the new book, but I'm oh, just cool. been designing it at my uh, in my living room. And here's what it looks like. Wow, I love it. Oh, that is awesome. There we go. Some exclusive news to, to you go. kick off this event today. I love it. That, oh, that looks great. That looks great, and I love that you're you're hand designing it yourself. I mean, that, that's yeah. Amazing. I wanted a sort of a, I wanted it to look cool and look official yeah. and look professional, but I also wanted a touch of the hand in it, you know. So yeah, I think I, think I got there. Yeah, awesome, awesome. I love it. Um, okay, before before we dive into to the movies and everything, though, you know, we are Halloween Daily News, where every day is Halloween, and we always like to try to start these interviews off. Um, if you'll indulge me for just a few minutes. A little bit about the holiday itself and and um and i'm always curious i mean you've been talking about these movies for 44 years <laughs> but in your life before working on films that would become synonymous with the holiday and tie you forever to the holiday do you have fond memories growing up of celebrating halloween itself absolutely uh my community bowling green kentucky celebrated it just about the way uh, most other communities in the U.S. did it. Uh, well, the way that Connell Cochran kind of contemptuously described it was we all just ran out and gathered up candy, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't think much more about it than that. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yes, I, every year there, uh, there was a certain time that adults became concerned and, oh, dear, we should... You know, there, there are hoodlums out there, or maybe there are razor blades in the apples yeah. or some ridiculous urban legends. Mm -hmm. uh, and so UNICEF got involved for several years. Trick or treat for UNICEF. And you collected oh, yeah. money for UNICEF instead of treats. But uh, by and large, it was just uh, my friends and I would go out and collect as much candy as we could. And uh, I Halloween kind of peaked for me one year when my friend Rick and I really worked at it for several hours. I don't even remember what we dressed up as. You know, at a certain point, mm -hmm. you're hitting teenhood and you're starting to understand that it's kind of stupid for older kids to be doing this, and yet mm -hmm. you're still doing it. So you stop wearing costumes and are getting away with it. With some people, you just go, I took a tree, you know, standing <laughs> right. in your t-shirt. Uh, we had worked hard for hours and had big grocery bags right to the top of yeah, trees. Yeah. And we're trudging home through the leaves and all. And a car pulls up and our major nemesis at the time, a kid named David Broderick and some of his hoodlum friends, jumped out of the car and grabbed, robbed us of our treats and oh. pushed, pushed us down in the leaves and drove off. And I was like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> that, I think that's what resonated so much for me when I encountered it and the opportunity to direct oh, yeah. uh, the original it uh, was that sense of being bullied a little bit by some stupid guys who uh, came along. And uh, it, it, that idea of, oh, we did the work, but they stole the goods after we finished doing all the work. That's no fun. That's not fair, you know? Yeah, yeah. So there's some some remaining some of those. I, I never was much of a juvenile delinquent, maybe threw a few <laughs> eggs at a few houses and a little toilet paper roll here and there. But mm -hmm. for the most part, I, I guess I was a fairly well-behaved kid. But Halloween uh, holds lots of fond memories of that sort for me. Do you, do, you, do you have a, uh, and yeah, it sounds like that year kind of peaked and, and kind of started going downhill from, from there at, at that point. <laughs> yeah. um, kind of peaked as far as the costumes, but then as far as the experience afterwards, it probably put a damper on it. But um, was that your favorite costume or, or do you have a favorite oh, costume? Oh, oh uh, far and away, I, my favorite costume as a child mm -hmm. 
was Zorro. Oh, uh, yeah. Several in fourth grade, what was on television and what was happening for kids, or boy kids especially, was Zorro, uh, played by Guy Williams. And he was all dressed in black and he just looked cool as hell. You know, it was just, oh man. I want to be Zorro. And even today, I was just communicating with a buddy of mine from, uh, he's in South Carolina, <laughs> and the uh, name is Henry. And Henry signed off saying, love you, Tom. Remember, I am Zorro. Uh, and yeah, I won, the, uh, I, I won the fourth grade costume contest that year based on the idea not how cool the costume was, but could they guess who it was? And for some reason, they didn't seem, they didn't recognize me under there. And I won the, I think it was the Schaefer fountain pen set or some, some deal like that. Anyway, yes, Zorro. Zorro was the costume. Awesome. That's a good one. I, I, I like that. And then we always have to ask um, your favorite Halloween candy. Candy? Yes. Jeez. Oh, Ah, well, uh, I thought it very adult of me when I switched <laughs> from stuff like Hershey bars and uh, Butterfingers and Snickers to the Heath bar. It seemed oh, yeah. like a very adult choice. It was a uh, toffee with chocolate on top of it. And like Oreos, it, you had various ways you could eat it. Uh, my favorite was to strip all, very carefully strip all the chocolate off the, the log of uh, toffee and carefully with your teeth until you had this golden log of toffee and then crunch that up. You know, it's an important detail of, of childhood. Yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, Heath. unforgettable. Heath Bar, that's for a, sure. That's a good choice. I like <laughs> that. Um, so um, again, let's, let's move into, to, uh, some of your film work now. Well, actually, I was curious because I know you you um, went to film school with John Carpenter, and that led to working with his films, which would eventually lead to Halloween Three. But um, you guys knew each other before then, is is that right? John and I knew of each other uh, all the way back in uh, all probably second, third, fourth grade. Okay, he, he was a year older, and okay. at that at that age, that's a big gap. So. We yeah. just passed in the hall. Uh, I got you. Tiny little K through 12 school on the campus of Western Kentucky University. But by the time we, uh, I guess, fourth, fifth grade, we got a little bit to know each other because we both played in the uh, orchestra. The, okay. Being such a tiny school, you were allowed into the the orchestra that had all the high schoolers in it mm -hmm. when you were in fourth grade because they needed, you know, they, <laughs> they needed extra bodies to fill it out. And John played violin. I was recruited as a trombonist uh, and uh, learned how to play it and reasonably well. Mm -hmm. and, but we didn't really get to know each other until uh, we were teenagers on one of those orchestra trips and I noticed John was sitting in the back of the bus and he had a guitar and he was playing something, probably some folk song or Simon and Garfunkel or uh, might have even been one that he wrote himself because he was quite a prolific pop tune composer back then. And what I couldn't help but notice was that all these girls were gathered around him. And I was like, mm -hmm. wait how's this work? And I went back <laughs> there and I'd been in kid choirs in church and I knew my way around music. I'd taken piano lessons. So it was no problem to start harmonizing with it. And uh, we sounded good together and uh, struck up a friendship based on music and making music and loving music. And uh, then the British invasion hit and we were mad about the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the other British invasion groups. Uh, and that led to a rock and roll band together. We formed a, a five man rock and roll cover band, played around that part of Southern Kentucky. So 
uh, John knew from an early age that he wanted to be a film director. I didn't even know, I didn't know what a film director was or did, mm -hmm. but he had it all mapped out. All he needed was a school. So I knew about this big blue book in the library that had all the schools uh, in the, uh, I suppose in the world, in the, certainly in the nation. Okay. Uh, and, and we went there together and looked at, uh, he kind of focused on New York University. Uh, Miami, I think, had a school, a film school, and University of Southern California. So he centered finally on USC and paved the way, went out there to school. And I went off to Ohio to art school. And when I graduated, uh, it was either New York or Los Angeles. And John was already in Los Angeles. Uh, we corresponded. His letters painted a really great picture of the area. You know, he'd say, I was walking down Sunset Boulevard and Buffalo Springfield was playing at the Whiskey. It's like, oh, my God. And yeah. the doors, really? Oh, my God, I got to go. So it wasn't that big of a, of a, <laughs> of a, hard decision between New York and Los Angeles with the, with the magnetic pull of, of that kind of stuff going on. And uh, so spring break, I took a madcap car ride with a couple of fellow students in a borrowed car and uh, took my portfolio. I was an art school kid, graphic designer. Uh, took my portfolio to the animation department where uh, USC film school was and uh, got accepted. Wasn't, you know, getting into college or getting into grad school back then, it just wasn't the same kind of big deal it is now where people just mm -hmm. prepare for years for all this stuff. It was just yeah. spur of the moment. Uh, and so as I was entering USC, John was kind of had one foot out the door already. Uh, mm -hmm. He was uh, working on his epic student film called Dark Star, along with yes. his classmate, Dan O'Bannon. And uh, they expanded that uh, into a feature film, sort of the student film that ran away and turned into a feature. Uh, and uh, I helped them out on that. And uh, that was the beginning of a, a nice uh, collaboration with mm -hmm. John uh, over several films uh, mm -hmm. in, in several different capacities too. We, we co-wrote other scripts several times, but uh, the runway up to Halloween 3 was because uh, I helped Dan out in the art department. Uh, he wasn't easy for most people to work with, but we got along famously and uh, he trusted me. And mm -hmm. so when Dan and John fell out at a certain point and uh, Assault on Precinct 13 came along, uh, mm -hmm. John asked me to be the art director. And uh, I wound up also cutting uh, sound effects and then cutting the action scenes in that movie. And that led to Halloween. John asked me to do both jobs, production designer and editor, which is a peculiar combination. It, it, yeah. It's great training. Uh, I yeah. learned. I learned so much doing that, but it's not a good combination for your health. You forget yeah. about sleep altogether. Uh, and, then, and then we repeated that on the, the fog. And uh, that led to uh, an invitation to direct Halloween 2. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work out because I just couldn't stand the script. Uh, yeah. And I would have been lying to pretend enthusiasm and try to fake it just because it was a great opportunity but mm -hmm. I just couldn't stand the script and really they deserve John and Deborah deserved a uh, a director who was truly enthusiastic about the material so sure. I thought you know when you say no to someone like that uh, generally in Hollywood they don't call you back now yeah. John was a very special friend and Deborah and I had become close so when they called me for Halloween 3 and uh, I was, Deborah called, I was in New York uh, writing for Dino De Laurentiis, uh, okay. what turned out to be the prequel to the Amityville Horror, The Possession. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. I was finishing that up when Deborah called and said, hey, how would you feel about directing Halloween 3? 
And I was about to say, are you kidding me? After Halloween 2, what could it possibly be? No, I didn't get mm. the words out because Deborah knew where my mind was going and said, mm. it has nothing to do with the first two. It's uh, all new, uh, anything we want to do. And I went, count me in. You know, and that was that. And the, and the rest is history. Um, so with Halloween 3, I mean... I always, I, I watch it at least once every year, you know, like a lot of people. And it always amazes me how how many elements of it were ahead of its time. And, you know, there's the technology of it all. But even in in things like Silver Shamrock, this, this company, this fictional company existing and the marketing for it all existing within this world. Um, things like putting the advertisements for the first movie within the world of <laughs> this movie, you know, things that, you know, I don't know if they've been done before, but certainly not on, on this level that, that I can think of. And I always think that it, it was just so ahead of its time. So I know when, when you, you came on, you've talked before that um, there was a script initially by Nigel Neal, and then you yeah. kind of took over and, and rewrote that. Um, can, can you give well, us to, some of the... To, to correct that detail. Okay. Uh, when I came on board, uh, Nigel, not too long after that, all of this is under a lot of time pressure because sure. Halloween's not going to move. We're going to have to release the film to coordinate with. They wanted it the very yeah. next oh, year. There was a lot of pressure. Day. And when Nigel turned in his script, uh, everyone involved, John, Deborah, me, and the suits behind the scenes, mm -hmm. it was a strange fascinating script with tons of good ideas and mm -hmm. frankly i think there must still be 60 percent of nigel's script in there but it was not ready for american youth audiences and all of the by then uh well memes you might say uh that that had grown up with uh, what we kicked off with the original Halloween was their sense of expectation from the audience about the kind of experience mm -hmm. they're going to have in the movie theater. <laughs> Nigel, it was like he'd been in a time capsule or something. He just there was none of that consciousness about it. Um, okay. It was fascinating, but it was fascinating mm -hmm. more on the level of a an early Twilight Zone or a British psychodrama from the 50s. It was a little bit dusty, I could say, yeah. uh, moldy somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, very creepy, but it just, it, uh, it was more appropriate to a, a, a British 50s mm -hmm. television situation, which is not intended as an insult because Nigel right. Needle is the acknowledged master of that specific media. Um, but I started out to simply correct you that <clears throat> after we looked over Nigel's script, it was John who did the next okay. rewrite uncredited. And then I rewrote John. Okay. So therefore that set up a situation where Nigel didn't like what we were up to, took his name off, left me with the credit or the blame, depending on what, what you think. Uh, and, uh, you know, 40 years ago, it was blame. Now I'll take credit. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, mm -hmm. But, but uh, so much of the, the plot and the characters uh, were originated with Nigel. It was a, a strange, interesting idea. I got caught up in a, a great deal of excitement around the idea of corporate malfeasance, television and the power of media in general, uh, smiling faces, concealing something sinister. That's my world. I, I really enjoy working in that realm. So I really resonated with the material and hopefully made it my own. If I had it to do over again, I would have uh, used a, the Alan Smithy credit. Are you familiar with that? Alan Smithy is a name that's used or invoked, we could say, when uh, someone pulls their name off a script 
it's to indicate, hey, there was somebody else involved here, but they decided not to put their name on the movie. Okay. That's a, that would have been a more accurate credit or screenplay by Joe Blow, Donald Duck, and Tommy Lee Wallace. That that too would have been accurate, but uh, right. I didn't think of that at the time. So, like you said, it was a lot of Nigel's ideas, but then John did that first rewrite, and then you kind of took it from there. And um, and but you were already responding to some of those things that that I'm thinking of as as were almost ahead of their time. Like you're mentioning some of the uh, technology aspects and media and the you know agendas behind the the corporate faces and all that and um and i think, I, I love all those themes in there i think what uh i believe it was deborah hill's brainchild in a the elevator pitch for this movie i as i recall was uh witchcraft meets the computer age which yeah. was prescient of deborah because the computer age hadn't really landed solidly by that point it was just getting getting up yeah. and running uh but i think that's what she gave nigel so he was he had that much of a theme to work with and of course he he came up with all sorts of original ideas to to uh amplify that theme and and w so the overall like the silver shamrock stuff that was there when you guys when he turn that um first script in and like the chalice character and all that was kind of intact and yes yes okay. he invented he invented the silver shamrock idea mm -hmm. and the, he was less specific about the masks and the, mm -hmm. the basically the original script he was more of a novelty company okay genius he had whoopee cushions and all sorts of of toys and bats on strings and everything mm -hmm. uh and he never did describe specifically which what the masks looked like okay. uh, that was left to us uh but uh yeah those those basic concepts were there mm -hmm. i was especially fascinated with the corporate dangers i don't mm -hmm. trust corporations and i believe we should be a lot more vigilant as a as a people as a government yeah. and as a nation about corporate misbehavior and corporate power in general so i really took to the idea of uh, i i stole from myself for the gray suits uh the bad guys the police force if you will mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the corporation uh i'd written with a with a classmate earlier i'd written a, a treatment called the corporate war which was about two corporations going at it, uh, mm -hmm. spying on each other and murders behind the scenes and all. And that's where the gray suits came from. And I thought that was great fun, you know, just uh, taking the ultimate image of the corporate man uh, yes. and and turning it into a bad guy. Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, kind of, kind of turning it in, into this, you know, stalker almost, you know, reminiscent in some shots of how Michael Myers would be framed sometimes in, in the previous yeah. movie, you know. And, I mean, well, there was some elements of that every now and then. Well, I, I was aware we were doing a horror movie yeah. and, and the horror movie needed to be in the same universe, at least, yeah. as the other horror movies that we'd done before. So, uh, in fact, that dynamic is what John wrote into the script and what i amplified okay. because that part of it wasn't present in nigel's writing he mm -hmm. just didn't supply this over kind of menace this sense yeah. of it, it just he hadn't he didn't use those tools those those particular tools of horror which yeah. were second nature to john and to me it was just yeah. like oh we've got to have impending danger and lurking people watching yes. things going on that just helps uh those are basic tools of getting people on edge in the movie theater yeah kind of along the lines of some of like the loomis speeches in in 78 and, and stuff exactly. like that exactly yeah setting and, it up talking about uh something's 
Well, it, it goes on and on. Something's wrong in dairy. This is from it. You yes. know, mm -hmm. you need you need Greek chorus type mm -hmm. of characters and groups of people saying there, there's, there's something going on here. Right. Uh, that's where the drunk character came from. Mm -hmm. uh, who warned oh, yeah. mm -hmm. early on. Was, ah, something's going on here. You know, right? yes. they don't pay any attention to me, but fuck you, Chalice. Mm -hmm. I'm not Chalice. Fuck you, Cochran. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. That idea, and then the guy gets killed. Those yeah. those tricks, they're cheap tricks, but they work. Uh, yeah. Those came from John and me. Yeah. And and you said um, the masks came from you guys. I was curious, was there a big conversation about uh, choosing these three masks? Because they have become so iconic and so identified with these films now. I mean, I've got one of the Trigger Treat Studios ones here. They're everywhere. You know, you go to conventions, you see yeah. those masks now almost as much as you see Michael Myers walking around. Yeah, um, it's, it's true. I uh, wish I had a nickel for every one of them, including yeah. <laughs> the Michael Myers mask. You know the story yeah. behind all that, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, anyway, uh, it fell into place beautifully. Uh, we needed, uh, we needed, I decided we needed three masks. Let's, let's get down to specifics, you know. Okay, now yeah. it's time to make the movie. Let's not talk about theory and about how many, a lot of different masks. Let's get specific. And the rule of three seems to prevail everywhere in everything is three is just a good number. So, yeah. and it was Halloween three after all. Yes. So uh, I said, we need three masks. Deborah was watching every penny. We could not afford to just sit down neither time nor money would allow us to sit down and design three masks from scratch, do the sculpting, mm -hmm. go through the process, audition, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it's the same story as the original Halloween. We didn't have the time for that. We had to go a different route. In this mm -hmm. case, by, by this point, Deborah had developed a relationship with Don Post, the mask maker, mm -hmm. who in fact, was behind the original Captain Kirk and uh, Mr. Spock masks. And when Deborah embarked on Halloween 2, they started out using my masks from Halloween, original Halloween, the ones I did. But those masks were a little bit flimsy. The, the latex was not thick. So I believe Deborah approached Don Post to, to crank out a few more. And if you look carefully at the movie, they are interspersed. Some of them look dead on exactly like the original. And some of them, there looks like there's a little something off mm -hmm. about them. And that yeah. would probably be because the thicker latex, as mm -hmm. well as the guy wearing them, uh, was Dick Warlock, mm -hmm. whose face is totally different from Nick's, Nick Castle's right. face, totally different from my face. And so it looked, right. a, little, it looked a little different, just mm -hmm. very subtly different. Anyway, I said all that to introduce the fact that Deborah, by that point, knew Don Post and had a relationship where she could pick up the phone, say, Don, mm -hmm. can we talk? We went to see Don and right away identified the skull mask as already on the shelf. It was like, okay. wow, that's really good. Maybe yeah. we could use that. He had someone had been working already on a witch. It was sort of on the drawing board. Okay. And uh, so there was that one that was already in the pipeline. The only one we just designed from scratch was the jack-o'-lantern. Uh, and it, it was, I just dictated it. It wasn't anything complicated. It's the two triangles and the smiley face that everybody everywhere carves into a pumpkin yep. so i thought it needed to be quintessential and no tricks you know just that's what that is yeah. uh and uh deborah it was a real coup for deborah because it uh in exchange for don being allowed to manufacture and market these masks um uh, mm -hmm. as a kind of a scratch my back and i'll scratch yours yeah. deal we got 
all the masks and the use of the masks and the shooting at his factory and everything for free in exchange for him having the rights to make those masks. So it was a real production coup for Deborah to pull that off. And that's, that's how they came about. The, the fact that they endure uh, mm -hmm. as they do, I'd say it's about half pure luck and coincidence and half, uh, I am a designer after all. So I, I care about color and yeah. the combination of colors. And those three colors together really, every time mm -hmm. I see so much fan art, you know, those three colors together, they just do it, you know? It, yep. It's unbelievable. The, it's like a flag or something that the, the three colors work so well together with a little bit of purple mm -hmm. uh, coming along for, uh, for emphasis. But no matter what they're on, look, here's some wrapping paper. The wrapping paper. It's amazing. It's both, uh, the, 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 the merchandise now. Merchandise now. It just blows my mind. People are yeah. <laughs> seat cook. I love it. Is that amazing? It is. Yeah. Welcome to Santa Mira. This yeah. Various, you know, big road signs down to postcards. I love uh, it. And a lot of fan art. This is fabulous. Something handed to me the last festival. That's there. awesome. Isn't that sweet? This is a hand. She did this, yeah. uh, brushed it on. It's only one of its kind. It's amazing. It just, uh, the fans showed a lot of love. And of course, uh, we, we just wouldn't be anywhere without them. There's a trick-or-treat studio, nice. Yeah, metal, I love that. Metal sign. My favorite of all is this one. This is the only one I've ever seen that I just immediately said, I want one of those. It is a Ouija board. Oh, that is awesome. Is that? <laughs> that is perfect. Yeah. That is really cool. So I don't know where we were, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, well, cool. yeah. Just talking about the masks, and like you said, they've, they've just become so identifiable instantly. You know, you know it's season of the witch now, and 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 you see them now again referenced in pop culture in other places. Other other yeah. films are referencing them in different ways, sometimes subtly, and and some. I just saw a music video just the other day. Um, Wednesday Thirteen is the artist, and he's got a music video with featuring the Trigger Chief Studios masks and kind of a, a whole Silver Shamrock flavor yeah. to it. I'll send you the link, but it's oh, it's everywhere. Great. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's. It's everywhere. Uh, it, has, it has exploded into a, it certainly has taken on a life of its own. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm deeply gratified. You know, it was a rocky start for Halloween yeah. 3. Uh, even though I look back at the figures on the box office and stuff, mm -hmm. and not only did it do okay in its, mm -hmm. in its opening, uh, but over the years, of course, it has more than, than earned a lot of money for somebody, not me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, modestly me, because I, I do get residuals, mm -hmm. but I didn't have a piece of the movie. So it's yeah. neither here nor there uh, personally. But it, it was perceived as a failure, um, mm -hmm. which still mystifies me a little bit, because I, I, I would expect the critics to be yeah. above the idea of, well, where the hell's Michael Myers, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I, I think there was a, a marketing mistake mm -hmm. in calling it Halloween 3 to begin with. Yeah. But that being said, and the idea that I think we dropped the ball in not setting the table, you know, it could have been solved by saying this year, folks, pay attention. We're not gonna do this, yeah. we're gonna do this. Uh, and we didn't trouble ourselves. None of us did. And the, the studio didn't. So we paid um, mm -hmm. the price. After all of that and it being perceived as this failure and so forth, the idea that over the years it has come into its own and found its yes. audience, uh, that really, that's, uh, that's a sweet feeling for me. It's a sense of redemption. And, uh, you know, I... I bounced around after that movie thinking, well, okay, if it's a failure, then I'm a failure. And, uh, you know, those feelings 
can uh, hold you back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So over the years, as it got redeemed, it was uh, a, a nice feeling for me as well. Oh, absolutely. It, that's great to hear. And it absolutely has had this resurgence, this reappraisal over, over the decades, over 40 years. And, yeah. and yeah, I think like, just like you said, a lot of it was how it was presented at the time. There wasn't the internet where people kind of knew what they were getting into ahead of the time. Like, like now we know too much what we're getting into, but back then you, you really didn't. And, and it did come out the very next year after Halloween too, as well. So, you know, I think being oh, so yeah, close, the, you know, we, we might have we might have been okay had there not been a Halloween two, mm -hmm. but there's that Roman right. numeral two. Okay, it's a sequel, mm -hmm. and then here's the Roman numeral three. That yeah. must be the sequel too. So, I mean, right. we really shot ourselves in the foot uh, yeah. over that part of it. Uh, this this is a, a convenient segue to to plug my book. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, where the, where the Hell is Michael Myers uh, is the subtitle of the book. This is the cover, the mock-up of the cover. That's a beautiful, That's a beautiful cover. cover. Yeah, thank you. It says uh, Halloween 3, Where the Hell is Michael Myers, the definitive history of horror's most misunderstood film. Uh, and by me, of course, and uh, with a foreword from Tom Atkins. So oh, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah, I, it should be out by the end of the month. And uh, I got a chance to really, uh, I didn't realize I had so much to say about it. I just mm -hmm. started out thinking about, you know, talking about how we got it shot and nothing crazy happened during shooting that made it into a, its own unusual story. But I kept mm -hmm. coming up with, oh my God, this blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. So it, uh, I really got a chance to say everything I can think of to say about that subject. Um, so I hope everybody enjoys it. It, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it wound up being really fun to write. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I hope it, uh, hope I covered the bases and didn't insult anybody. I actually mm -hmm. pretty complimentary about everybody I mentioned, I think. Mm -hmm. Even Nike. Yeah, because I, I was under the impression for years that Nigel kind of left us in the lurch. Mm -hmm. uh, he he decided to take his name off the movie and not do any rewrite work. Well, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty standard in Hollywood when you turn in a script that you're going to get some notes and yeah. you're going to want to make some revisions. That's just the way things are. He bristled at that and. I've learned since that, A, he felt he had fulfilled his obligation, so he wasn't uh, quitting on us. Mm -hmm. And uh, B, he had been through so many disappointments that he had become somewhat embittered. And I think he had kind of a chip on his shoulder. So when we started talking about, you know, we, we need it yeah. to be this, or we rather it would be like that, or what have you. Uh, I think he took umbrage and said that basically he thought that these punk kids, these upstarts are out to destroy his <laughs> movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, I think now the experience of going through this and talking to his biographer, Andy mm -hmm. Murray, and I think I understand better where he was coming from all along. So I believe I treated him fairly. Nice, nice, very good. Nice, kind of nice to see everything kind of, kind of come full circle and 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 get get the full story now. And yeah, I can't wait to check out the book. I know fans, you know, are are gonna snatch it up. And and the fact that it's being released this month is even better, just in time think, for the fortieth anniversary. Yeah, I think fans will be satisfied. If anything, I, I do a chapter on uh, merch and uh, mm -hmm. fan art, fan yeah. art. Uh, Oh, this is one of my favorite pieces of fan art. Can you see little buddy? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and he's on his little That's, stand. That is such an iconic scene. I, I wanted that? to ask you um, about another, probably my favorite scene in the movie, um, while I've got you for a few more minutes. It's, it's the, the Cochrane speech, and then at the end of it, 
you know, I love his whole speech about the meaning of Halloween. And then he, yeah. he puts the skull mask on, on Chalice and he's walking away and, and 78's playing on TV and he says, happy Halloween. And then I always get chills when the music on TV in the 78 film filters in and fill, and, it, and it's like that becomes for a few seconds the soundtrack. the soundtrack to Season of the Witch. And it's this surreal moment. And Chalice, of yeah. course, in that moment is wearing the skull mask. Yeah. It's just, it's my favorite scene. And, and it, oh. you know, the, the, the Chalice speech and everything right up to that whole thing. And, and again, I think it's one of those times where it's so ahead of its time. Um, you know, the, the first screen movie, I don't know if you know, but they, they did a similar thing also with Halloween 78 in their film where they kind of used that music yeah. on TV and, the, you know, very similar idea, which clearly inspired by Season of the Witch. But can you talk just a little bit about that particular scene? Because it's, it's well, I love it every time I watch it. It, it uh, I'm really glad to, to hear that. It, it uh, Matt, it, it's gratifying especially because uh, <clears throat> the whole scene and situation made me nervous because it's so, what's the word? It imitates uh, some pretty old cliches, uh, Dudley Do-Right and uh, tying the damsel in distress on the railroad track and the train is coming. I mean, right. He's in this chair kind of thing, but he's just got these little straps around him. And as a child, if I were watching that, I would go, wait a minute, he can get out of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was nervous about elements of the uh, scene that clearly didn't bother you. But, yeah. but uh, there I'm sitting going, oh, come on, you know? He, uh, and, and this is typical for a director or a writer to do. You look at the movie a different way than the people who are just enjoying the movie, the audience, uh, thankfully, because mm -hmm. uh, like so many others, when I watch my own movies, all I see are the, what I perceive as the flaws in these yeah. scenes. But I did feel very strongly that the movie came down to uh, Cochran's soliloquy on Halloween. Mm -hmm. that, that really puts things in perspective that Villains don't think of themselves as bad people. Right. The, if you do a movie where the villain thinks of himself as a bad person, I, I guarantee you that movie's not going to work very well. Mm -hmm. Villains have to be convinced of the rightness of what they're doing, that somehow in their mind, at least, even Vladimir Putin thinks he's right. Uh, and uh, Cochrane, I think, acquits himself quite nicely when he talks about it's time it this is this is inevitable it's got to happen this way yeah uh, that's i added that to uh, between john and me we made sure that went in because nigel's original script the entire thing rested on the fact that cochran says oh it's all a joke it's just a joke. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, I, I don't think that's going to work. I'd love for that to work. But it couldn't be Dan O'Hurley playing that part. It would have to be like Robin Williams or Billy Crystal yeah. or, or a real funny man mm -hmm. to say that line and get away with it. Because it's such a cruel line. It's yeah. a horrific concept that someone would say, oh, this is for a joke. Well, if you cast Johnny Carson in the part and he said that, mm. you go, oh, my God, uh, my head's coming off. That's too scary and too weird. But it wasn't enough for a regular guy. And, and there's nobody better than Dan O'Hurley uh, yeah. playing that part. Uh, the book reveals that we first offered it to Fred McMurray, if you can imagine that. Oh, wow. Uh, that would have been that would have been pretty mind blowing because, of course, Fred McMurray to my generation was known as sort of America's dad or the absent minded, the nutty professor, absent minded professor, whatever he was, but likable old guy, uh, mm -hmm. my three sons' dad. Yeah, but in fact, if you go back and watch Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity. 
Fred McMurray is a shit. He's yeah. a horror. He's an evil guy. So that would have been fun. But yeah. uh, he, he turned us down. But failing that, I don't, I can't think of anybody better than Dan O'Hurley in that part. He just really nailed it to the wall, especially, in, especially in that speech. Uh, yeah. Halloween, the way he says it, Halloween, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's iconic. And yeah, he absolutely nails it. And, and like you said, I mean, that speech that kind of distills the whole movie down. Like if, if I had to pick one scene to, to yeah. you know, yeah. uh, highlight that, it's, it's got to be that one for me. Well, I love that it. point too. That's quite a convention yeah. that the, the evil guy is talking to the victim. Mm -hmm. Well, in my, in my child's eye logic, it's why don't you just kill him right there? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're the bad guy and he's the guy that you're going to destroy, go ahead and destroy him. Right. But then there wouldn't be any fun of drawing it out that way. Yeah. And, and explaining the only, the, the only yeah. way you know that the movie's working is that people will sit there and listen yeah. to that entire speech and and dig it you know yeah <laughs> you know it, there's there's no accounting for it except that uh performances matter mm -hmm. good, good performances matter they they're the glue that holds the movie together oh absolutely and that's a great one and, and like you said i just think at that point in the film you know if you're 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 into it as the viewer. Yeah, you're yeah. you're, you're you, in there you, by that if point. You didn't, if you didn't buy in, you already got the theater, <laughs> Right, so. exactly. Yeah, if you were going to have a problem with that scene, yeah, you didn't make it to that scene. You're right. 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 <laughs> but I, I love it. Um, and again, I mean, 40 years later now, and the film is absolutely more popular than ever. Um, right. And and like you said, it didn't necessarily fail at the box office. It was just, it, it didn't do what maybe certain well, people yeah. were expecting or thinking but halloween but, of course was such a box office phenomenon right. and halloween 2 came along and did very respectably uh and so the expectations for halloween 3 were very very high and it didn't rise to those expectations so you had a disappointed uh i think universal was disappointed but I, I, you know, I just stand there and say, how could you be disappointed you, you didn't set the movie up for success? Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. you, mark, you put it out there in a lot of cities. You did that part great, but mm -hmm. you didn't set the table. I, right. In the book, I even wrote a, uh, an as-if ad, what yeah. we should have done, the ad that should have been. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah, you know, it just, it, we we dropped the ball. It's the simplest way to say it. And maybe it would have, if we wanted an anthology, we would have dropped the number. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, anymore, it's more fashionable, you know, like the Batman series or Harry yes. Potter. They don't bother with numbers. Exactly, the, yeah. The next installment. Uh, if it had been Halloween, colon, Season of the Witch. Yep. And with a little ad to set the table, we might have gotten away with it. But calling yeah. it Halloween 3 was a desperate mistake. And it is fascinating to think about now those what ifs of like what, you know, just removing the Roman numeral, like you said, Halloween season, what would have this franchise become then? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy. I mean, and they eventually did stop using the numbers at a certain point in, in this franchise mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. It, it's it's pretty wild to think about all these years later, you know, and just kind of fun every now and then to be like, well, what if they had gone on? Were there, I'm curious, were there conversations with, with you guys about what a potential fourth movie that would follow this anthology model would be or it never got that far? We never got there. Yeah. Um, obviously, doing Halloween 3 was a, was a big task mm -hmm. uh, in, under a lot of time pressure. Mm -hmm. So we were very focused on that. By the time it came out and was perceived as all oh, boom, you know, the air went out of the balloon. Yeah. Uh, we really never got around to discussing other ideas. It would have been fun and it still kind of blows my mind that nobody's ever taken it up because it's, yeah. it's a money-making idea. There are so many stories that could be told and of course people are still telling them, 
under other titles uh, and other mm -hmm. franchises uh, that it uh, it would have been fun to see where it would have gone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have a have a a new horror movie set on Halloween, but just kind of loosely well, it, in the same universe, but kind of just a whole other story each yeah, every could year, every other year or something. Could easily have given birth to other franchises as well. Oh yeah, that's it's, true. Yeah, yeah. We could have had had more Silver Shamrock movies. <laughs> um. Well, and I wanted to ask about that, too. I was curious if you've seen the most recent two movies, Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills, because they do um, incorporate the Silver Shamrock masks in those did, movies. Did, did you did, know that? I didn't even know that. Uh, yes, they, uh, they, yes, yeah, they incorporate them. And I'm hoping they do in, in the new one, Halloween Ends. I'm hoping they're, but, but yes, they're, um. They're very kind of subtly used in a quick trick or treat scene in 2018 film. Spoiler alert! But sure, um, sure. but and then they're they're actually used even more prominently in a in a very fun scene in Halloween Kills as well. And they've got some trick or treaters wearing them. And but they are, uh, I guess they're trick or treat studios ones. But they've got the, the silver shamrock thing and all. And it's, yeah, yeah, they got the button. And um, I was just so just geeked out in, when the 2018 film came out and to see those masks just acknowledged just in, in that fun kind of cameo capacity yeah in a michael myers focused halloween movie i was like well thank you thank you everybody for doing this and uh, <laughs> why not why not yeah i i just thought it was so cool to to have that and then and then yeah you've got to check it out because they're they're used again even like i said a little bit more prominently in halloween kills as well so i'm hoping they there's some variation on the jingle in the new one i would love to you know again i i don't know if that's going to happen um but um I'm, fingers crossed you know i give us some more silver shamrock as far as <laughs> i'm concerned um yeah i honestly except for h2o mm -hmm. after halloween three i i haven't yeah. watch I haven't kept up at all with the rest of them mm -hmm. um, you know i i felt just like john and deborah did after halloween too they'd had enough yeah uh now they were lured back in i mean money mm -hmm. will talk uh right. as it did to john and it did to uh jamie certainly mm -hmm. but uh now you know people ask me oh what did you think of the name i say listen you know uh I like a good horror movie, but I'm not that much yeah. into it. You know, it's, it doesn't touch me. I, I I do have other things going on in my life. So, <laughs> right. Uh, but H2O interested me uh, yeah. a lot because it basically followed the notion of what I was lobbying for on Halloween 2 before John wrote the, the five minutes later script. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted a five years later kind of script. Uh, okay, Laurie Strode is traumatized beyond belief, barely yeah. able to function, had therapy seven days a week for three years or five years, and is finally venturing onto a college campus somewhere that is well protected, high walls, security out the wazoo, and oh shit, that can be made into a prison as well as a security place. Right. That's pretty much what H2O, H2O was working with. Yeah. Uh, so I was gratified to see that idea come to life. But That's interesting that you had that idea back then for, for oh, H2. I, I, and, and I, was I was lobbying for that, but John mm -hmm. wanted to go a different way. Mm -hmm. it, you know, clearly his way worked. Uh, that movie yeah. made a lot of money. But even John now... Uh, admits that he doesn't like it very much <laughs> yeah. yeah he uh feels he kind of feels he sold out mm -hmm. and of course the the iconic mask of michael myers we have to talk just a second i mean you you were the one to transform that don post kirk mask um and again 44 years later there this is the 13th movie about to open now i mean it's it's everywhere you can't go to not even just horror conventions i think like comic cons you're not going to go to one without seeing a couple michael myers walking around stalking around yeah. um 
I mean, I know you guys couldn't imagine it, but but what what are your thoughts on on that that image becoming so you know synonymous with the holiday and with horror now? Well, on the downside, I just look at it and say, "Damn, I wish I had a penny for every one of those because I didn't <laughs> yeah, I, I, bet. I didn't make any money to speak of off of Halloween." Yeah. Uh, now coming to these conventions since has has paid me back pretty nicely yeah uh, so uh my feelings about it have been assuaged i guess you could say mm -hmm. but on the upside it's nice to be the the uh midwife if you will of a of an icon mm -hmm. uh it makes me feel like wow i i was right there in the zeitgeist yeah uh, it uh, and I I like the feeling that okay the way I'm thinking and the way uh, my ideas have some relevance you know to where we are today as a culture uh, yeah you know that's that's kind of gratifying and uh, I enjoy seeing all the hoopla around it it was lightning in a bottle. Uh, mm -hmm. When I did it, it was partly out of necessity to want to alter the mask to some degree, mm -hmm. and also uh, just to make it my own. Uh, you know, paint it stark white and take away the sideburns and stuff. And it really got to be an eerie looking thing, but I didn't realize how eerie until the person at the production office modeled it for us and came out. and before we got to a script or scary music or a plot or trick photography or incredible lighting, I knew we had a terrifying movie because that damn thing was just scary looking. It just struck mm -hmm. you in the heart. It's like, yeah. holy shit, how'd that happen? And it, it had that effect. And yeah. that's truly lightning in a bottle. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't, it, some of it's a, just a happy accident. And some of it I will take credit for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you, uh, you definitely deserve it. I mean, and yeah, the, that that look and as with the Silver Shamrock mask, I mean, they are all just like I said, you can't go anywhere without seeing them now um, between the merchandise and, and fan events and just social media. You know, we get tagged in this stuff all the time and it's amazing the tattoos people get. I mean, I, I'm sure I know you see it all the time at, at Events that, you're at, I mean, the, the, that blows my the mind. fandom is massive. I, the first time a woman got me to put my autograph on her inner thigh, and then yeah. she came back later that day and showed me she'd made it, gotten it made into a tattoo. It was like, wow, what? Yeah. Really? Are you kidding me? That, That's wild. Not, not to mention the endless uh, shape. And uh, Halloween three stuff that people sure. are putting on their bodies. It's like, wow, who knew? Who knew? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. And and just such a part of pop culture. Like I said, I mean, you see these yeah. these references all the time, and um, it's it's always just amazing to me to to see. So it must be, you know, it, it is cool to me for me as a fan, and and you know, to hear you say that it is gratifying and that you are feeling some of that that love oh. and 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 that you you know because i think it's relatable to to myself i know and probably a lot of our viewers that you know those feelings of of what it probably felt like 44 years ago uh, or 40 years ago and um and you know in recent years to have that gratification coming back in and that love and and to have people really i think it's you know, giving the film a chance. You know, it was like going in after Halloween 2 with certain expectations and, like you said, not being prepared. But now you go into it, you're prepared, you know what you're getting into, and people give it a chance and they're like, whoa, this is cool. This is different. This is something, you know, a little unique. And for people that, you know, just love Halloween horror movies, period, you know, it's, it's definitely got its own unique uh, thing going on. I think one of the secret weapons of Halloween 3 is that it really is about Halloween. Yes. Unlike, unlike the original, which after yes. all was originally titled The Babysitter Murders. That's and right. it's about yep. babysitters. 
And it's set at Halloween, but it's not especially about Halloween. Whereas Halloween 3 is all about Halloween. That's why year after year, people want to use it as part of their ritual. Yes. There is only one aspect about this whole thing that disturbs me. Uh, there, there are folks out there, horror movie fans, and it's very obvious when you get to certain movies that the audience, certain members of the audience are actually rooting for the psycho killer. They're like, right. yeah, you know, Jesus, right. wait a minute, what's going on here? Yeah. Like, oh, that's somebody's actually rooting for a guy to stab and maim and dismember some fellow human being. That part's a little upsetting. I, yeah. I mean, uh, I understand suspension of disbelief and you're in a fantasy world to begin with, but mm -hmm. it is also saying something about our culture here that uh, um, I'm, I, I'm not sure it uh, bodes well no. for the future. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's definitely, you know, and it is interesting how, you know, how fandoms have, have changed and, and, um, and, and, you know, how the bad guys, you know, I mean, you, like you said, you're always kind of, but with those, some of the classic monsters are a little more um, sentimental to begin with in, in a way. And, um, but I guess it, it, it all depends on, um, on the, the audience and where their, their mind's at. And it is a scary time right now, for sure. It's true. It's true. God knows where we're headed. That's, that's it. Um, so the book, you said it's, it's going to be out uh, this month. Do we, do we have a release date? I, or or where can are, people... Fingers are crossed. Okay. Uh, I'll get it out on uh, my website. Okay. And, and of course, uh, I don't, I, I'm, I'm guessing that it'll wind up on uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, but stay tuned is all I can say. Okay. Uh, uh, we're working hard to get it. Uh, it took me forever to finish writing it. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the encroachment on the deadline is, is my fault, but uh, I wanted it to be right. And, uh, yeah. and, and to measure twice, cut once kind of thing. So, yes. uh, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best to make sure everybody hears about it through all the usual channels. Excellent. Excellent. And we'll, we'll be here to help spread the word as well. And I can't wait to order my copy and um, yeah, and, and, and read more of these behind the scenes stories. Cause as you can tell, we, we can't get enough of this and I could, I could talk for a couple more hours, but I know you got a lot going on and, and you're busy, but um, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time and chatting with us today and, and, and giving us some uh, Silver Shamrock stories and a little bit of Michael Myers talk as well. Thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure. And, Absolutely. Uh, to everyone out there, happy Halloween. <laughs>